Welcome everyone. My name is Kiana Witted and I'm a professor of English and African American Studies here at the University of South Carolina. And I'm here with Bill Campbell and Bijan Kodabanda to talk about the day the Klan came to town. Thank you both for having this conversation with me. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So I'm going to just start off by asking the two of you um, to introduce yourselves a little bit and tell us some about your background and the work that you've produced. Bill, do you want to get us started? Uh, sure. Well, uh, as I said, my name is Bill Campbell. Uh, I'm the head cook and bottle washer at Rosarium Publishing. You know, we do uh, comics and science fiction, um, all with the multicultural flares. I like to say, whoever you are, you are in Rosarium. Uh, this project uh, just kind of came out of the blue. I guess you'll ask me about that later. And um, well, and Bijan, who is a, a Rosarian and has been a Rosarian for years, um, he was just the logical choice, which we'll get into also. But um, we could just go with that for now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Bijan. Uh, so yeah, I'm, B I'm Bijan Khodabanda. Um, I have a background in uh, graphic design uh, originally. and. I've been moving towards uh, illustration and been doing a handful of comics. Uh, so yeah, so as like some of the work that I've been doing with Bill for Rosarium sometimes involves uh, cover design and those kinds of things in addition to doing comics that he publishes of my work. Um, and uh, I'm currently a professor uh, in the advertising program at VCU's Robertson School of Media and Culture. Wonderful, thank you. So let's talk about the day the Klan came to town. That's that's a some title. Um, it gets gets your attention right away. Bill, can you take us through the story that is being told in this comic? Well, um, basically, um, how this all started started. Uh, what was this uh, Easter back in twenty nineteen? I think. Uh, my brother and I, we were uh, at my mom's house and we were just talking about the hidden history of uh, the, all the things that they don't teach you growing up in Pittsburgh. So mm -hmm. we were just going through like this miscellaneous things. And a lot of it is just like industrial accidents that happened, which they didn't really tell us because, you know, we were like a steel town and coal mining town. So they didn't want to tell us that, you know, there was once like a poison gas that went through Denora and killed 14 people in an afternoon, you know, stuff like that. And then my brother was like, oh yeah, like the Klan riot in Carnegie and Carnegie is our hometown. And I was just like, I grew up there and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> so, yeah. so that was sort of, I mean, that was basically what kind of happened. Like I was obsessed with this thing that happened in my hometown, like literally nobody talked about it. And even still, like when I, later on, I was asking people from Carnegie and like the surrounding areas, like, have you ever heard of this? And out of like all the people I went to school with, like one person had heard about it. Like, it was just like this total secret. And it was like 1923. So, you know, mm -hmm. when I got there in 1978, there are still people alive who, from that, that time, but yeah, it was like a complete town secret. So, um, the story is basically, it's a fictionalized telling of what happened. And what basically happened was, um, you know, it's 1923 and the Klan was at the height of its power. So, you know, um, so this was after Birth of a Nation came and it just inspired like, you know, white people to just like join the Klan in droves because it's, um, you know, it wasn't just, it was like the great migration was happening but also just, just tons and tons, like millions and millions upon millions of immigrants were coming from, from Europe. And, um, you know, so native, native born white people were just, you know, um, losing their minds basically. <laughs> so, so the Klan grows from just like this, just basically, it was basically, it wasn't non-existent, but it, you could basically say that it was in 1917. It just balloons into like this national organization and it's all across the country. And, you know, they, they, they're still a terrorist organization, but they're so huge 
that that they basically kind of pawn themselves off as like a civic organization, as as a political force, and they're like openly running candidates. And the thing that was so attractive to them about Carnegie was it was a steel to, it was a steel town in a mining town. Like literally, the the town was the mine. <laughs> like in fact, like when they build houses in Carnegie, like you have to put in special foundations because you're literally building on top of a mine. <laughs> like on the bottom of the hill, on my and where I live, was a mine entrance still. Um, so it, 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 it attracted tons and tons of immigrants. And so um, there was one street that had uh, two Catholic churches on it. So that was their special target, was that because Carnegie had so many Europeans there and it had two Catholic churches and they were hugely, um, you know, it, or sorry, two Catholic churches on one street. They had many Catholic churches there and two Orthodox churches, like it was just that heavy. So they decided to have Carnegie Day with a K and um, basically about 30,000 clans people from all of like Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, as far as Kentucky, Maryland came. Um, and there was like one big hill where they had like this huge picnic gathering fireworks. They initiated a thousand new clans members. And then at night they came down the street and started a riot, which ironically enough, which is why it's also weird that I never heard about it. Uh, one of those Catholic churches was mine because I went to Catholic school. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so the Klansman who's killed was literally killed on the doorsteps of my childhood church. And yet again, never heard about this whole thing. Uh, and you said it was a thousand? A thousand no, no, people. they marched, they, they had about, the town was about say 11,000 people, half of whom were Protestant. So at the largest to meet the clan was maybe like 5,000 people, but probably was like less than a thousand people. And the clan at the march was estimated, like the march down the street was estimated to be about 10,000 people. So they were, they were outnumbered about 10 to one and they were fighting for their lives. So they, they were pulling up cobblestones out of the streets. They were like ripping up wood fencing. Like they literally fought throwing coal. <laughs> like, like these were just desperate people just fighting for their lives against you know a much a, a much superior force yeah so you, and you talk about this in the afterward about the research you did sounds like you really had to dig into the archives to get some of this information and given your work as a publisher and writer what made you decide to approach this through comics um, well, you know, the, um, well, one, I think, cause I'm a publisher, I don't have time, but also, um, when the story popped into my head, I was coming home from TCAF cause I live in DC. So, and, you know, I was coming home from Toronto and, uh, my, my wife and my mom make me stop in Pittsburgh to sleep. So I was literally driving around Carnegie when the story they have like popped into my head and it actually popped into my head, the main character, Primo Salerno popped into my head as Bijan's art. Like that was mm. like the weird thing. But I think that because one, I don't have time, but two, because I was like, it had to be Primo. So, and I don't, I don't, know enough that I could like properly portray like a uh, Sicilian in a novel. Okay. Does that make sense? So then the, it does make sense. So then you thought about Bijan and approached him. How did that process go? Uh, pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Bill just called me and he was like, hey, I have this project idea and I was like, sure. <laughs> you know, okay. like, we've, we, we've already discussed previously working, collaborating on comics. So it, this isn't, you know, this wasn't the story that we talked about, but it, it was, yeah, it was, you didn't have to sell it to me at all. <laughs> I was immediately down. <laughs> awesome. So you, so you're already sold. Tell me a little bit then about some of the conversations between the two of you, how this collaboration unfolded in terms of telling the story that uh, Bill just shared with us. What part sort of 
came easy? What parts did you have to spend more time to develop and get right on the page? This is for Bajan. Oh, for the draw for the <laughs> illustrations. So I'd I'd say I'd say like uh, some of the historical aspects, you know, so I had to keep on asking, we, we created like a private Facebook page that we were able to share content and history and Bill provided a lot of historical documents that he researched. But given that I'm, I'm like super attentive to detail and that might be the, the graphic designer in me, I kept asking questions like, what angle are they looking at from here? What building are they in front of? What street are they at? Like, is that really like the ingredients for this meal that he's eating? And even though it's like this tiny and no one's going to be yeah. able to tell because it's black and white, I'm asking, you know, those questions to make sure that I get it as right as possible. Um, so that that part was a little bit time consuming, I'd say, um, out of anything. And the cars, those that time period's cars are just awful to draw. <laughs> They're so oh, hard. Okay. <laughs> so I, I mean I wound up go, I, I mean I wound up I wound up going to Carnegie back to Carnegie like three times I think for this. Uh, part of it was just because there was so little. Even though I just did a Google search and it's a lot easier now to research that uh, Carnegie Clan riot than it was then. <laughs> so <laughs> so we changed something. We it's even like on the wiki page now for Carnegie. Like they actually mentioned the riot now. So oh, that's cool. Uh, there we go. We that's changed good. something. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I like, yeah, I think I, I was able to easy. find like an academic journal that that like and and maybe like a newspaper clipping that I read that yeah, and that, yeah. those, that was those like things I, those things I used, but those they were harder to find than they are now. <laughs> yeah, but um, but and it and it was for B, uh, but a lot of it was like just trying to find old pictures from then, and then just going through the town and just trying to find anything that was still standing from 1923. So like I did take pictures of like, you know, the street and of course the church, but the church had changed too. Like, so I had to find like, you know, like the steeple. It was like really like on, on the visual mm -hmm. sense, it was kind of interesting to just try to like go through your hometown and try to find like all these different things. Like the original bridge on that street was gone, but oddly enough, like, 200 yards away, uh, there's an old rusted hunk of like the exact same bridge on the street that like no longer exists. It's just still like hanging over the creek. So I got to take a picture of it just so you could see. So it was like kind of like a treasure hunt in your old like place that you never go back to. So I guess you can go back at least to take pictures. And then just <laughs> going to the historical society and just constantly looking for like any kind of like old pictures from the time that could that could help him out like that was on the visual sense <clears throat> um so on the writing, it, it, go ahead oh i'm sorry you were about to say on the writing oh no on the writing sense it was like a weird project for for me and for him too because it was like because i didn't have the time because you know i had a day job and the kids and rosarium so i could only write the thing in pieces so basically he didn't get a he would, I would give Bijan like scenes <laughs> to, to draw. Yeah, we, I think we start with the chapter breaks first and then, and the, and the general, um, the character designs and then went from there. Yeah. And then, so it wasn't, it wasn't a sequential story at all. It was just sort of like, I'd have a scene in my head and then I'd write it and then I'd send it to Bijan and then after I had enough scenes, like, I guess like months later, I like took three days off of work and then turned it all into, and like filled in the blanks and like gave him a cohesive script. But it was, it was a weird kind of, it was a weird project. Cause you know, we just like, he had the middle and the end of the book before I had the beginning and just like all this weird stuff. And then, you know, like he's, he's drawing the beginning but there's nothing other than like three words and the the sound the the scene of the town <laughs> you know oh yeah, yeah i forgot about that yeah it was just the <laughs> dream and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> like hey they're going to tear this town apart what's next i don't know <laughs> that's a really good moment though that's a really good moment yeah just have him look out the window <laughs> <laughs> so then if so you're giving photos, you're talking about the angles, all those types of things. You want to get the cars right, you know, you're you're Googling. But then in that translation, Vijan, I'm wondering about places where you um, did some creating 
some narrative structuring of your own, are there aspects that when, when Bill talks about filling in the gaps that you um, had to sort of contribute through, through your artwork, through your uh, design to the page in which you helped to fill in those, those gaps? It, it's probably like some of the crowd scenes, like figuring out, you know, how to how to maintain that many people, like especially like the, uh, you know, when you got to the riot, like trying to figure out how to make that work, especially because you you often think about those things, and, you know, it's streets. So they're like kind of stuck in these like, you know, almost like trenches, you know, kind of space environments. It's not like, you know, like the those epic like fantasy you know two two clashing armies or something you can't really do that from far away because there's buildings in the way so figuring out how to navigate that was was kind of interesting but i feel like i mean bill did a did an incredible job breaking panel to panel down and really described what nice. was happening i mean i just kind of i feel like i just drew what he told me to draw but i enjoyed it i still took some creative liberties but i feel like i didn't I didn't feel like I had to make up stuff. Like he did, a, he did such a great job of describing what was happening. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you, because it was less difficult. Because <laughs> like the riots, I like riots are like not made for comics. Like that, that's like totally cinematic. Like that was like the really like that was like to me writing was like the hardest part. Like just just trying to imagine how to describe the riot. And like the riot itself in real life is a lot more complex than we could do in the comic. Mm -hmm. um, because oddly enough, in real life, um, the riot stops for a minute. <laughs> stops and what, ha what happens when it stops? So basically, like the, the, the Burgess of the town, which is basically the mayor, because like Carnegie isn't a town, it's a borough. So it had a Burgess instead of a mayor. So he's like abandoned by like state officials because a lot of them are a lot more clan sympathetic than they would say. So they just, and he was Irish. So they're like, we don't care about you, <laughs> you know, because you know, you're not white. So we don't mm -hmm. care. Uh, <laughs> um, but then one like county official came in and was like, no, we can't like have this town burn down. So he actually stops the riot. Like he stops it and he's like, y'all go home. So the clan's like, okay, you're right, we'll go home. So this is like this great cinematic moment, but it's horrible for a comic. So <laughs> the clan starts going home. They start marching up the hill and then they're like, nah, psych. And then they just rush them. They like, like, like totally rush them and just beat the living daylights out of everybody. Okay. And I'm like, this is just the greatest movie moment ever. You can't do this in a comic. It makes no sense. <laughs> but it, but y'all figured out a way because it works. No, nah, no. Nah, I was I was really impressed like with what BJ did because like just trying to describe it, I was just like like that was probably like one of the hardest parts. Mm -hmm. Like just trying to it's like that and like things like the firing squad. There are just some things like like you can I can I think visually, but there are just some things like mechanically that I just can't picture, which fortunately he can. <laughs> well, I, I love that you guys are talking about the crowds because that was actually one of the striking um, aspects of the graphic novel in thinking about what you were relaying even through the way the characters were crowded and massed together. So for instance, when the Klansmen are, whether they're parading through town or at their, what was the little, the meat they have in the woods, um, they're arranged in a very particular way. Um, there's a kind of orderliness to it. And of course you've got the, the iconic hats and the sheets or or whatever whereas the crowds of people who are who are resisting their presence um they are all at different angles it seems to me they're they're holding the the bats and the objects and the bricks and the coal and so there's a really there's really nice you know full page spreads of these 
different contrasting crowds that I thought was especially interesting. Um, if I uh, if I was able to do a screenshot, I would probably show what on on my PDF is page I think it's seventy eight. It, the scene where after um, the Klansmen realize that there's there's people shooting at them. They stream out with the torches and and you see the little aerial shot and they're walking behind a car. Mm. Um, moments like that, I, I thought were were really nice in terms of setting the the suspense and the pacing and all that good stuff. So um, I I thought it was terrific. Thanks. Yeah, I had a lot of that page. I was actually having a lot of trouble figuring out how to how to make it work and then the aerial shot came to me and i was like yeah this is this is the perfect solution for this yeah that one was hard because i because uh, like i know where that was so basically it was um well we call them hills i guess some people would call them mountains but you know it was, I was on a hill that was a farm but that hill was converted into um uh, a park and then a whole bunch of housing. So I knew the road um, that they marched down, but it kind of made no sense, like taking a picture of it. So like I couldn't give Bijan like the the visual cue because it wouldn't have looked like anything. So that was like one of those things where I had in my head, but I couldn't convey it. But uh, but also like seeing it because I like. When I'm reading that whole thing where they're all marching and like, you know, with the torches at night and they're singing Onward Christian Soldier, like you can like feel it, <laughs> you know, like, so, um, and then just the numbers, like that's also something that's like hard to convey that, that I think mm -hmm. did really well, like just how outnumbered these people were. So I'm, I, I will acknowledge that as I'm reading this and a lot of similarly themed or historical graphic novels these days, I think a lot about, about March um, and the, the three volume trilogy uh, and run, the, the, the latest. And one of the things when I use that book in the classroom that we talk about is the very iconic scene at the Edmund Pettus Bridge at the start of that of March book one, how important it is that we recognize John Lewis in his signature trench coat, right? And even the, in the midst of that um, protest that turns into uh, that horrible beating on Bloody Sunday, we see the trench coat, right? But, but the, um, the deputies, the sheriff, the folks on horses are very much interchangeable. They're wearing masks. And if they aren't, you know, you can't really make out their faces. I'm bringing this up because one of the striking things that occurred to me as I'm reading this is that the Klansmen had names and some of them had distinguished faces from panel to panel. Some of them are characters in this book. And I wonder if you all had, had a conversation about what it what it meant to sort of um, I don't want to say, well, human, they're human beings, but to, to sort of give them, you know, one has a mustache, one has signature facial expressions, one is, one is wearing the, the, the red or the darker um, clothing, I guess that's the hit with the dragon. Um, what does it mean to sort of give them a character, to have them be characters in this? and give them names and faces that people can point to and identify versus making them sort of nameless crowd of Klansmen. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, some of them were actual people. Right. So that's, that's part of it. Um, but then the other part is, for, for me, from an art, art, uh, artistic standpoint, I just wanted to have good character design so they didn't seem like I was cookie cuttering every person and then that that obsession with detail i just i wanted to make sure that like they were in the same locations and it was the same people talking to the same characters so that there would be a consistency throughout so it didn't feel like they were just uh sort of a generic you know cookie cutter human being 
I, I don't know if I were personally was really thinking about it from a, from a metaphoric standpoint so much as I was just trying to make it feel like a believable uh, space or believable environment. Um, on my end, yeah, I, it was just, um, you know, even though this is, you know, a, a fictionalized thing, I mean, this is historical. So one of the things that um, was very interesting at the uh, Historical Society of Carnegie, right, when I go there, uh, one of the guys, he pulls out the 1924 uh, phone book, right, and under the heading of Secret Societies uh, was the Ku Klux Klan's uh, phone number. Um, so yeah, you, you mentioned that in the afterward that they're right. listed under secret societies. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, I kind of get why people would do that, like make these people faceless and anonymous and stuff. But the very important thing was, was that they weren't, mm. <laughs> was that they weren't. Like the clan was so popular that people were like, even though that they did wear hoods and all that stuff, a lot of them were openly clansmen and clanswomen. They were like, I am the leader of this, you know, this chapter. I'm the, I am a Klegel here. I am part of Claver number, whatever. I'm going to make a, the conclave and all the other K words that we're just going to make up. I'm one of those. So I think that it's very important that, no, these were not masked individuals trying to terrorize people. These were masked individuals trying to terrorize people and say, hey, look, I'm the person who terrorized you. Vote for me. You know, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, I think it's very important that people know that. I'm glad that you open with that phone book thing because it's kind of like that. It's like that. It's like poetic. It's like that. It's secret, but here's our phone number. You know? <laughs> right. Like <it's>... <laughs> <laughs> so right. So I think that that's a, that. Even though we, yeah, I don't think either one of us gave us any thought. It was just like they were openly about it, you know. So, you know. Um, so yeah, we should have their faces and their names and all that stuff. Um, because they they weren't ashamed of it, you know. Uh, why rewrite that? You know, it's sort of like those articles of secession, right? You know, those Southerners have said, "Yeah, we are here to fight for slavery." They weren't ashamed of it, <laughs> right? 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 Yeah. So then, I'm curious in thinking about the story's approach then to uh, resistance. So this gets us to to the sort of last third of the graphic novel when we do see the riot and we do see the pushback. Um, I, I did offer the comparison to March, but I um, could also bring forth a few other historical graphic novels I teach in my classes, including Nat Turner, you know, um, and thinking about what it means to to really amplify and linger on this moment of both individual and collective resistance. Do you feel like that is part of the story that you want to tell and the way you all told it? I mean, there's there are people who are part of the crowds of immigrants who are shooting here and, and you know, shoot Klansmen. They're not, this is not necessarily, this is not the 60s, they're not approaching you know, resistance in, a, in that particular way, they are taking a different approach. Did you have any concerns about the risks of portraying armed resistance or any of those types of things? Uh, Bijan, would you, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy question. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm personally not, I'm not a pacifist. So like, it wasn't something that really occurred to me. I actually think that it's great be that because we typically, I feel like with a lot of these stories, you know, oftentimes the the people that these bigots are attacking are are the victims and we only they're often only being portrayed as a victim, but this is an instance where they are proactively stopping and driving out these, you know, horrible, you know, people from from their space and doing so successfully and it's it sounds weird, but it's like it's kind of uplifting. Like when I was drawing it, I was like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. Know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like because throughout the story, when you're when you're, I drew it sequentially, so it's it feels mm -hmm. like 
I'm experiencing the story with them to some degree, like as I was going through the pages. And so like to have that, you know, it, it was, it was nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a pacifist either. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me see here. Um, oh God, this is going to sound a lot more radical than it then it should just be commonsensical, right? It's sort of like, it is the people, the powerful people who have absolutely no problem exercising violence on us, who constantly tell us that violence is not the answer. So here is a story that clearly encounters that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, do with it what you will. Nicely put. <laughs> Nicely put. And so then you kind of responded to my next question about how this story then fits in with this larger trend that we have. I mean, when people hear about um, the, the story, the, the plot, the conflict behind the day the Klan came to town, you know, Teachers like myself are thinking, ooh, can we use this in a classroom? Parents are saying, can I share this with, with, with my kids? There's a tendency to go towards the educational and informational value. And you, by providing the information about the archives that you look through, you help to sort of facilitate that, that reading as well. But I wonder how you feel you're participating in that expectation that, um, that you may have teachers asking about how can we use this in the classroom or, or parents or librarians or so forth. What do you think about some of these larger trends in the way historical graphic novels are kind of unfolding these days? That was like three questions, three, 30, 50 questions into one. <laughs> well, I mean, uh... BJ is the, well, you two are the professors, you tell me. <laughs> um, well, okay, so it was, it was kind of interesting because um, we did a, I, I think we did a, oh my goodness, things, things like, I think BJ and I did a panel recently. Uh, and I said, like, kind of the interesting thing is because I always pose my, I always thought of myself as an artist who like kind of poses questions and never has answers. And then I was like, I think I accidentally, like we created something that like has an answer to something. Hmm. You know, like it was kind of, we stumbled on something here. Yeah. Um, so basically, I mean, what you have, uh, and it ends up being a lot more pertinent than when we started this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like it, um, but so when you look at these people, right? When you look at these immigrants, like you have to realize that, you know, because they're they're all from Europe, and you know, we we have them with some black folks and and you know some Asians, and they're like we have um, Armenians and stuff, because we had very we had I had a like very sketchy census data, so I kind of knew who was in town, but I didn't know exactly the numbers, so that was all kind of vague. Like the thing happens in Irish town. But I knew from census data, and I know how small Carnegie is, and I knew that, like, they weren't, they didn't know exactly where it was going to happen. So I know that there were other people involved, like, I because it always says Irish and others. Mm -hmm. So we know that, so we know it was in Irish town, we know it was Irish and others, but I also know that the other Catholic church was German, because that's where I'm from. I know that St. Joe's is German. <laughs> you know, and St. Luke's where I went was Irish, um, you know, and all this other stuff. So, so you have this mix, but you have this, this weird concoction of people. And the reason that they're attacked is because they're, you know, they weren't white at the time, mm -hmm. right? So you have this like desperate group of people who get together, who don't necessarily like each other because they're all like... Uh, you know, like people don't realize like at that time, like there wasn't really ethnicity, there were races. So all these different people are viewing each other as different races, right? And they don't necessarily get along because they have like their own little weird 
racial hierarchies, but all they know is like, well, the Klan's coming after all of us, right? So I think that when you're looking at like what's happening today, right? You have this group of people who call themselves real Americans and then they sit up there and they say like, the three of us aren't. Now, all three of us have different varying histories. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm half Jamaican and half African American, and you know, um, there are people on both sides that don't necessarily like each other. <laughs> you know, but we're in a situation, in a very large sense, just like those people in Carnegie. Mm -hmm. So this is the teachable moment. So what do you do when y'all are sitting up there on this? on these fringes and you're being attacked by this larger force and y'all don't necessarily like each other. Maybe the answer is in that book. Maybe that's a teachable thing, you know? And it sort of sounds like, I like the way you put that because the, the kind of next chapter or the, the consequence of some of this is, as you talk about in your afterward, is about whiteness and racial formations and we see the, the, the evolution of that continue after this book in sure. really interesting and troubling ways. So- Well, well I, mean, that, I mean, that's the thing that I find kind of interesting about reading about Americans and especially in terms of like racial history is like, you know, there's always like the one thing that I find so interesting is like, there's like these pivotal moments where America could have done right by black folks and they just can't do it. <laughs> like, like, it's like, you're so close and yet ah, you can't do it. But then there's always like moments like this, right? Mm -hmm. What if all those people just decided to be the other? What could have happened? America's, what did happen? Right, you know what I mean? Like America's history becomes a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so I'll I'll um, wrap up this part and then we can and close by asking with my reference to I mentioned already like Nat Turner in March, but I was also thinking about uh, one of my favorites out of print, Stagger Lee, um, and other graphic narratives like the best we could do, they called us enemy. Um, Diary of a Reluctant Dreamer. Uh, there's a new one, Murder of Emmett Till, out by Oxford that I haven't had the chance to take a look at yet. I'm curious about your thoughts, either one of you, about why comics have become such a fertile place to tell these stories. Like, how is it that, I love that you say you saw this as a comic right away, Bill, but it also seems to matter that the marketplace is such that they're receptive to these stories and that people are picking them up now in ways that they haven't, we haven't seen for a while. So um, do you, you all have any thoughts about that? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be deep, but I'm just curious, even if it's just a marketing consideration. Go ahead, man. I think that there's there's probably a multiple reasons for that, but I, I'm not sure because I don't know the numbers. But I feel like you're having a a, ge a generation of folks that where there isn't a stigma about um, age and complexity and sophistication with comics that grew up, you know, reading comics their entire life. And the same thing you could say about video games and a lot of nerd culture and why it's so becoming more and more popular because you know these folks are getting older and they're still cosplaying, they're still, you know, reading comics, they're still playing video games, and they're not thinking like this is kid stuff, it has, you know, no place in academia. And and I think that that's also, you know, we're starting to evolve a little bit more and maybe starting to resemble some of uh, the cultures overseas as far as like the, the breadth of uh, genres that are accessible to us in the United States. Um, it's probably probably helping that significantly. And, and also, you know, there's a bunch of librarians that are advocating, you know, comics as as a, a good starting place for readers that are maybe reluctant, you know, so, yeah, a lot, I think that there's a lot of factors happening right now. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would totally agree. Just in the eight, eight years that I've been doing Rosarium and stuff, like, I've just seen, like, I think, like, 
basically is more, um, you know, uh, Gen Xers and millennials move more and more into positions of, I guess, respectability. You're just seeing attitudes toward comics and science fiction. And like you said, video games has just kind of changed. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like baby boomers are like, ah, you know, comics, ah, that's kid stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think he's just totally right. Like, it's just too many of us just kind of grew up with this stuff and not necessarily viewing it as kid stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. that now, well, I uh, mean, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, then I was just going to say, and like, and now we can explore more adult topics and, you know, I mean, you know, like the best we could do is like, you know, I'm, I, I, that's like my favorite graphic novel. I think mean, I'll, I'll admit it. <laughs> like, just because, you know, just like as an immigrant's kid, even though that's not how my dad came here. My dad came here on a plane to be a student. It was pretty boring. But, <laughs> but, but, but you know, it's just like, just kind of like hit you just like, you know, but you know, you can explore those things in comics now, which you couldn't do. There's no publisher that would really touch that like kind of thing like 10 years ago. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's so good. It's such yeah. a good book. Yeah. It is such a good book, but it also, you mentioned about comics and kids. So it makes me want to mention that uh, Superman Smashes the Klan won all the, all these sorts of awards <laughs> this year. So, you know, kids can also uh, access this material as well. And I mean, I have to say, I, I would agree last 10 years, we don't, or 10 or 20 years, haven't really seen um, this sort of flourishing, but I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't talk about the fact that, you know, in the 50s, which is the period that I love and that I work on. You should um, write a book about that. I should. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was reading and looking at these great layouts of the Klansmen all in a row, it made me think about the whipping. Okay, so of my plug for EC, everything. Um, it made me think about the whipping, which is, which is about a family man in a suburban neighborhood that could be anywhere in America. They make a point to say that. Uh, and they decide to don some sheets one night and go after a Mexican-American uh, man who's moving to the neighborhood. So, I mean, there are ways in which, you know, earlier during that period, we do see some of this historic, well, it wasn't historical then, it was happening then. Um, but you do have like, um, some of the historical biographical comics and other things. And maybe I'd like to think things like the day the Klan came to town are bringing some of that back. That's what I like to think. Um, so I mean, we're, 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 we know we're, we're, we're trying. I mean, I just thought like for me personally, the thing that I, I found so fascinating about that story, like the historical story is like, get again, it's like, one of the it's like you know in the whitewashing of american history like it's just like it just kind of shows like it's so deliberate it's so deliberate and it's just like stuff like that right like they want you to believe like it's just sort of like white and black right and it's just sort of mm -hmm. like but it's like our stories are so much more complex than than that and like i think that that's the thing that drew me to just telling this story was just like here's another instance where like looking at american history just kind of is just so much more complex than that than we're taught you know mm -hmm. That, that was actually something that i appreciated about the way that you you kind of imply some of those um some of that dissonance between the different groups, which I feel like if it was a different time period or, you know, people would be like, you know, holding hands and, like, you know, like, yay, we're reuniting together. And it's like, that's not exactly, you know, how that kind of stuff happened. I mean, even when you do, you know, I mean, you don't have to spend much time political organizing with to know that even if you're doing it with your friends, there's going to be some dissonance happening in those in those meetings and in those situations. Right, well, those rifts within the group are very well done. Yeah, and I just think like that's kind of like actually like important to show. Mm -hmm. Like because like when we go, you know, when we were all young and idealistic you know, we go into these settings expecting like kumbaya stuff, right? <laughs> right? But 
maybe like if we actually got to see that people like did organize and still got stuff done and some of them actually hated each other's guts but they're you know, but they still are like there was like infighting and sniffing and stuff but they still accomplished stuff i think that's kind of probably like an important lesson to learn probably pretty early mm -hmm. yeah. so i did like the fact that you know yeah because you know i grew up hearing these people still you know 50 some odd years later still calling people just like horrible stuff <laughs> you know, you know, so it wasn't a yeah it wasn't it wasn't like, it wasn't kumbaya there's those factions still there but when there's a common enemy it makes me think about watchmen and then people do band together sometimes <laughs> i mean it's i mean you should you just should you know so I've taken note of this 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 wonderful line from the, the book, We Americans Love Forgetting. And I feel like um, you all are helping us to, 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 to see that that's sort of not the way. And this book helps us to, to remember. And as you say, to sort of unearth something that people haven't been talking about for a while. Um, so any sort of closing thoughts on what's next? You want to tell us what, what you all are? Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to catch you off guard, but I'd love to hear if there's anything you're working on that you want to share or anything going on next. Oh, well, I mean, for us together, um, there was a project that we originally talked about doing together, which um, holding close to the vest that we actually have to talk about soon. <laughs> I want to do it. I'm excited about this project. I know, me too. <laughs> um so um that <laughs> um i just recently um wrote like my take on the black superhero which is a lot different than i think people would um normally think of black superheroes so that's, that's good. That, okay yeah that's the thing that i'm working on right now sort of i'm working on a rewrite right now so I can okay. give it to my, to my agent, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's a, I, I, it was just sort of, it's sort of like black superhero and stuff that's going on right now. It's just like, there's something that's always bugged me about black superheroes. So I just kind of wanted to explore that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, me personally, by myself, I finished a couple projects that I've been doing just on my own as explorations that it's been nice to take a break from figurative work. I put, I collected a, collection of abstract comics where I was just exploring formal relationships between stuff. That was a lot of fun. And I finished a short that uh, an author in uh, Britain asked me to complete that is a really interesting take on um, vampires and it's told from the perspective of a um, of their butler and like what he's seeing and his thoughts in his mind, which is really cool. And he's talking about potentially expanding it to something more long form, but um, I'm not sure. I won't, we only have that six, that short six pager right now. That's uh, up online. It's available to just download for free. Oh, where is that? Um, I have a link on my website, um, but it's a, that we posted on Twitter. You, but it's called. Um, oh, now, I, now of course I forget what it's called. <laughs> the title of it. We can, we can make sure that it's included in the description. Or yeah, yeah, I'll, or... I'll send it to you. But yeah, I can't think of the name off the top of my head right now. It's something very like it's like a saying, but I just can't think of um, think of it off the top of my head. No worries, no worries. Yeah, well, yeah. thanks for for spending the time for letting us know and talking with us about the day that the clan came to town. Appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome and thank you.